Hello everyone. Can all of you see me and hear me? Please type in the chat room. This is just one minute before we start our webinar and we want to make sure we have the proper volume and image. We're trying our very best to be as efficient as technology allows us since all of us are in so remote and distant um, locations. It is just one minute before noon in Guadalajara or 7 p.m. in Germany. Somewhere in between, all of us are connected now. I want to give you a cordial and warm welcome to the 12th of our webinars. Let me start by explaining briefly who are we and what is it that we're doing. This is a Erasmus Plus project called RIESAL and the acronym in Spanish stands for the Regional Network for the Promotion of the Internationalization of Higher Education in Latin America and the Caribbean. As you may know, it is a project co-funded by the European Commission within the Erasmus Plus Capacity Building in Higher Education program. You must, be, you must be aware by now that the objective of the project is to contribute to the improving of the management skills of higher education institutions in Latin America and the Caribbean and to boost their internationalization processes and re-engineering their interventions. That is, we are aiming at providing with material and information to help foment the management of higher internationalization in the region. Many actions have been um, occurred for that matter, and one of them is a series of webinars. We have had in the past 10 webinars with information regarding several topics of internationalization. Now we are in the second grouping of the, of the webinars, which is sharing best practices found by our colleagues. That is the reason why we are having um, this series now. And that is exactly the topic we're having at this very moment. Before we get into the webinar itself, we would like to explain once again, what is the mechanism that has best worked for us in the past. Due to the number of participants, we are going to restrict microphone and camera usage. And we cordially invite you to type in the chat room below us any comments and questions you might have as our presenters proceed with the webinar. At the very end, we're going to collect them all and present them in the screen that you're looking at. And our presenters will be able to go over them and address your comments or concerns. Um, without any further comments on the mechanics, I would like to introduce you to today's webinar, which is University Business Cooperation, how to get started and succeed. Uh, our partner institution, the Fachhochschule Munster, or University of Applied Sciences in the city of Munster in Germany, which is a member of the project, considers that University Business Cooperation, or UBC, as the acronym that you'll be seeing later on this morning or this afternoon, is at the core of university's goals as it gives relevance to education and research by creating socioeconomic impacts. As important as it is, many universities struggle to start, manage, and succeed in this type of collaborations. In this webinar, 
we will focus on the key factors to foster UVC in universities and the particular characteristics that each university requires for success. We are honored to have with us today two members from this partner institution, the Fachhochschule Munster. Uh, they are on the screen at this very moment, showing in the cameras. This is Professor and Dr. Thurston Klinwin, and he is an international expert on the topics of entrepreneurial and engaged universities, collaborative innovation and change management in higher education institutions. He is passionate about fostering the interaction between academia and business to create economic and social impact. Professor Kliewe is co-founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of the University Industry Innovation Network, an Amsterdam-based headquartered network with more than 200 members from more than 25 different countries. He's also the founder and chair of the Accreditation Council for Entrepreneurial and Engaged Universities, which promotes organizational development and cultural change in higher education institutions by offering the world's first accreditation system for university entrepreneurship and engagement. He is a full professor for innovation management and business development at Munster Business School at the Munster University of Applied Sciences in Germany and the Deputy Director of the Science to Business Marketing Research Center at the same institution. The S2BMRC, acronym for Science to Business Marketing Research Center, is a worldwide recognized research center that conducts research and develops new models and tools for successful science to business engagement. Next to him will be Lina Landines, our co-presenter, and she is an international expert on topics of research, development, and innovation in the context of universities and higher education. She is passionate about interdisciplinary work to foster innovation with societal impact. Lina is a research associate at the Science to Business Marketing Research Center, which you will become to know. It's called the S2BMRC, and lecturer in innovation at the Business School at Munster University of Applied Sciences. She is at the final stage of her PhD research at the University of Adelaide in Australia, focusing on technological change and so social capital. Lina has a broad expertise, including government institutions, research centers, and universities in Latin America, Australia, and Europe. Lina is currently coordinating international projects to develop higher education strategies for collaborating with Latin American universities on entrepreneurship and innovation. Without any further delay, I now shut off my microphones and shut off my camera and offer the stage to our dear colleagues who are going to present to us. We'll be back to you once the presentation finishes. Thank you for being with us today. Welcome everyone to our webinar. I hope you can hear us well. Um, it would be great if you could briefly confirm this in the chat. While well, saying this, we can get started. So uh, again, welcome wherever you are on this planet to our webinar on University Business Corporation, how to get started and succeed. Um, thanks a lot for the welcome, warm, welcoming words, Ismail. Um, that enables us to move a bit quicker forward, um, as we have done already the introduction. 
So as Ismail mentioned, Lena and I will host this webinar together and um, we have here on this slide, which uh, you will have access to later on as well, our contact details because we are always interested in collaborating on the topic of UBC, on entrepreneurial and engaged universities and related topics. Good afternoon everyone, uh, good night in Germany. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. I think I met some of you in uh, the first uh, meeting of uh, RISA. Um, and as you might have known, I am still on maternity leave. That's what I kind of left the project for a bit. Um, and I'm mentioning this because my baby is at the moment sleeping. So if he wakes up, I might need to run. So I beg for your patient and Torso will take over if that happens, but uh, we will be here for the Q&A um, at the end. Okay. okay, with this we can get started with, with the webinar. Um, first of all, I would like to take some time to briefly introduce the S2BMRC. Um, Ismail already mentioned the acronym, it's called the Science to Business Marketing Research Center, at which Lena and I work. We are based in Germany in the city of Münster, at Münster University of Applied Sciences. And our focus in the center is that we aim to extract the full value of science. Um, and that includes transfers from science to business, but also from science to society, and we try to bring science into innovation, so to transfer it to innovation. These three topics, science to business, science to society, and science to innovation, are actually three different research streams or research lines which we have in the center. And Lena is coordinating the science to innovation uh, research group. As you can see from uh, the slide, uh, we are a very international team. Uh, we are in a fairly large uh, research institution with 28 different team members, with 18 different nationalities. Our members have a diverse set of backgrounds, including architecture, political sciences, psychology, health, and so on. And this is actually helping us to innovate because innovation usually happens at the intersection of different cultures, different disciplines, uh, different industry sectors and so on. As you can also see, we are very, working very internationally and um, enabled by, of course, the international team we have. Uh, and the reason for this is that the topic of UBC and entrepreneurial engaged university development is a global phenomenon. And the interest in our work actually comes more from countries um, outside Europe and also in Europe and even to a lesser degree in Germany where we are based. So we're very happy to uh, be able to travel around the world and share our knowledge um, personally, but also, of course, through webinars like this. So the core belief which we have in the center is that we believe that research on UBC, so on University Business Corporation, makes a significant and meaningful difference in universities and businesses. Having said this, I would like to um, deconstruct this a little bit on the next slide because it actually has two different elements. So on one hand, we believe that to make this significant and meaningful difference, we first need to develop a deep understanding, a deep understanding of the field. So and for this, we conduct research. At the same time, we want to not only enable this difference, but to actually make it. And for this, we have to become practical. So we work practically and we work with businesses and work with and for businesses. So and here you can see the, uh, the, that we are doing research as well as business. So we are working in a university, but also with and for businesses. So we, we try to bridge these two um, different worlds. So to ultimately um, create the value, the ultimate the value that we can uh, generate in a university. Today's agenda is um, basically um, constructed in four di main different points. First of all, we will have a look at uh, how universities, what are universities today? 
Second, we have a look at UBC from a relationship marketing perspective. Um, thirdly, we come to the main part of this webinar, the success factors in UBC, and we conclude with a short summary. So with this, I hand over to Lena, who will uh, lead the next section. Okay, so to understand a little bit more what um, UBC means for universities, we would like to start with um, a little bit of um, sorry, with um, an overview of the changes that universities have gone through uh, during the, 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 the years they have been existed. And where are they heading to? We believe that um, in the future, universities that put an emphasis on third mission are they going to be the, the, the flagships uh, in higher education. And how did we get to that? We first started with the first generation of, um, of universities, as we can see here in the graphic. Um, and this first university, the first generation of universities focus mainly on education. That means that um, the, the mission was to transfer knowledge. And to this transfer to knowledge, of knowledge was given to a very elite communities. Uh, univer uh, universities were a very close uh, circle of, um, uh, of people that just shared the knowledge among themselves. And this continued like this for a couple of uh, centuries until um, they started to think of research as another of the missions of universities. And the idea was not only to transfer knowledge, but also to generate knowledge through, the, to, through research. And this included um, wider communities. So universities started to expand a little bit into more lower classes um, societies and started to, to, to socialize more the knowledge they were creating. Um, over the years, uh, research was, uh, has, a, has a focus on more basic research, which, me which meant that um, it was mainly to create knowledge and to share it. Uh, but then this knowledge started being applied, and that's when applied research became more central to universities. Um, and from there, it's very easy to understand that this application of knowledge became the main reason to, sorry, the main vehicle to create impact in societies. And that's how we got now into the third mission of universities, where uh, universities focus on um, create a socioeconomic impact and not only um, educate people or create knowledge through research. Here, it is important to understand this third mission in this way because in this way we can include technology transfer, which is when the, the traditional way that we see a third mission, and also UVC as a broader understanding of, uh, of this um, socioeconomical impact. This uh, is, is a major transformation in, in higher education institutions. That means that um, a lot of changes need to happen within the university and also in the context around them. So this massive change uh, is taking over a lot of resources and effort of universities. And uh, universities are experiencing that at the moment. So they're also leading the topic, and we don't know exactly in which direction, but what we know is that a lot of changes are, are happening, especially in the culture and in the social uh, context of universities. In relation to UBC and third mission, uh, the traditional understanding was that universities develop some research uh, try, develop that into some technologies that could be used in, in society. And from there, the technology transfer office were in charge to transfer that, to put that into the industry. And that's why, uh, from this traditional understanding, the patents became the main vehicle for transfer knowledge. 
However, our new understanding of university business cooperation allows us to see a fair mission beyond a specific technology and a specific pattern uh, and brings all stakeholders of society into the university to cooperate towards a new solution. So in this way, we define UBC as all types of direct and indirect personal and non-personal interactions between universities and business organizations without a specific, um, an specific outcome generated at first sight as it was the patterns before. In these um, interactions, any, any other outcome is possible and can be defined from any of those uh, of both sides um, to generate new solutions. Uh, it could be relationships uh, that are more focused on research, could be contract research or joint publications. It could also be some interactions that are more related to create companies or transfer technologies, for example, spin-off startups, uh, in inclusive, including patenting. Uh, or it could be any other form of interaction, for example, training, placements, um, industry boards or university boards, sharing facilities, consulting. So UBC allows us to have a whole range of interactions that goes beyond the technology and beyond the knowledge that has been generated previously on the uni in the university. Um, and this change in focus uh, from patenting to UBC also implies that there is a change in management. That's why uh, universities need to adjust and it becomes difficult to manage uh, this, new, this new thinking uh, because we go from transaction marketing based on the patents to a relationship marketing uh, that includes um, a broader interaction among different cultures, among different stakeholders, and requires different um, management strategies. So we're going to have a look to what relationship marketing means and what is um, what it means for UBC. Yes. So in this respect. Um, you might first wonder why we are now talking about marketing when we talk about um, innovation. Um, and this is why I would like to go one step back and uh, basically highlight this uh, specific view on relationship marketing. So the idea of marketing in general is very simple. And the idea is that if we expect resources um, may this be knowledge, may that be funding for an accomplishment like research, then we are on the market. We have supply and demand. So we supply research and then we have businesses who demand this research and we expect something in return. So it doesn't work differently to any other market um, that you can imagine. The market for automobiles, the market for um, for groceries. Um, also, there is supply and demand. And when we are on the market, what companies do is they apply marketing models and instruments to be successful. May this be customer satisfaction measurement, may this be some portfolio analysis, and so on and so forth. So the original idea, which um, was the foundation of our center, the Science to Business Marketing Research Center, was that we look closer at these specific marketing models and how we could use them to be successful in university business cooperation. Having said this, it is important to understand that marketing is not just communication. We hear that a lot that people say, great, these are the marketing guys, they can create nice flyers and nice brochures and TV commercials, things like this. But communication is actually just one part of marketing, not even the most important part. 
So this is why uh, we presented here um, a statement which tries to highlight this. So communication is shouting, marketing is listening. So communication is about telling what you're doing, telling what you're aiming to do, communicating your product, if you like, if you're, uh, if you're a company. So this is what happens in the second stage. But marketing itself starts much, much earlier, and it starts with the listening part. It starts with trying to understand what your partners, what your stakeholders are actually after, so that you can create exactly this and then communicate this to um, the target group. So communication is actually the second step. And in respect to communicating science, sorry, to marketing science, um, it is important that the target group is not only the public. And that means that um, we have for a long, long time defined the target group as the public and we try to communicate as broadly as possible. Public relations, press releases, um, we try to get into all this media to reach everyone. But at the same time, that results in that we are partly reaching no one or no one who is actually our main target group. So someone who wants to interact with us. And often businesses and non-profit organizations who could engage with us in research were not attracted by our, by our very general public communication. To highlight this approach a little bit more, um, um, here we state at the top that marketing also is not doesn't mean selling fridges to Eskimos. So we are not trying to focus on just selling what we have generated. So as Lena said, we are not just trying to sell um, a patent to someone who might not even need the patent, as the Eskimos don't need any fridge. So marketing really means to take the stakeholders' needs, expectations and benefits in the center of your thinking and acting. So we as universities try to first understand what our stakeholders, our partners in this respect, let's say in, for research, are actually after. What kind of challenges exist in society? May this be a challenge in health? May that be a challenge in um, reducing the energy consumption? Um, may that be a challenge, uh, a social challenge um, for educators? So we are trying to understand what needs are there in practice what expectations do our stakeholders actually have, also in terms of the process of engagement, and what benefits are they actually after. And then we take this as a starting point and act accordingly and think and act accordingly. So it is primarily also a mindset. Coming back to the idea of communication, and I would like to illustrate this marketing mindset through uh, an example. So when you try to sell a house, normally you put out um, a sign such as this, for sale. You put that in your, your front yard. Or in German, it would mean zu verkaufen. So to sell or for sale. So this is a very um, self-oriented perspective. The Dutch do that differently. The Dutch say, oh, the Dutch say, te hoor and te koop, which means to buy or to rent. So they take the perspective of their stakeholder, of their client, not their own self-view. So if I say I sell you a house, that it puts a focus on me, myself. Whereby if I say to buy, the focus is actually on the buyer. And that's what we want to do with marketing. We put the focus on the actual stakeholder with whom we want to engage with. And this is a German example. Uh, unfortunately, most of you will not be able to read it, but I will explain it to you. So this is a, a little sign which you find on uh, some tables in restaurants. And usually you will find there a sign which says, uh, this table is occupied from 8 p.m. onwards. But you can also do that in a different way, and this is an example for this. It says, this table is free until 8 p.m. It basically gives you the same kind of information. So the table is occupied from 8 p.m. or free until uh, 8 p.m. It's basically the same, 
but the wording is very very important it is a completely different approach which you have uh, towards accomplishing a goal and it's much more inviting to say that a table is free for some time please have a seat please have a beer uh, rather than saying like please don't sit because uh, soon there will be someone else coming or at 8 p.m. there will be someone else coming so this is a kind of mindset that marketing um, is all about coming back to actually the technology transfer and UVC field so Lena already referred to that we have the traditional approach uh, with patenting and licensing and it basically worked like this we are in the labs and we are um, conducting um, research and we are trying to uh, generate new knowledge and technologies and we do that alone in our ivory tower in our lab and then we try to uh, bring that to industry I usually say we try to throw it over the fence and we hope that someone is at the other side of the fence and wants to pick it up and hopefully industry is then also willing to pay for it as the question mark here indicates this is a very unsure process because if we develop something we without the industry or the businesses involved there might not be actually a market need for it there might not be any benefits for it or it is it is developed in a way that industry cannot understand the value of it so all this results in that there is um, there is a high likelihood that what we develop in universities will actually not be transferred to industry and that means that we don't have entrance to the market so uh, uh, trying to address this we understand UBC as bringing industry industrial organizations into the process at a very early stage as indicated here the university works together with industry um, this could be very closely in a joint research center but that could also be that industry is um, is giving you insights into the demands of uh, in practice and like this with more or less intensive um, collaboration you develop knowledge and technology and because it is it is developed with the market in mind or market partners already involved you have market entrance or higher likelihood that it actually um, becomes applicable in the market and that it makes an impact so here we can see that we move from uh, a transaction where we do something alone and we transfer the uh, technology um, through a license to companies we move to relationships and we move to doing something together collaborating and this requires a completely different mindset and it requires completely different processes completely different support systems and there are different mechanisms which um, help to make this specific relationship approach work and this relationship approach is what we are talking about today and on the next slides we want to um, highlight certain success factors in UBC so on the next couple of slides we present some more general success factors to take into account when considering UVC um, why do we do this um, we are researching this topic for more than 15 years now um, at the same time we are practicing it so we bring together the the experience from theory as well as practice and we are helping universities and businesses around the world also to make this process efficient and effective and successful in the end we're doing this because we truly believe that this is as Lena presented the future of universities the future of the universities and the impact that we are making depends to a very very high degree on the translation of scientific results into uh, economic and social impacts so we present these general success factors to you so that you can use them as a starting point for discussions amongst um, maybe the participants but also in your institution and take the first steps towards UBC we have overall six different success factors success factor one 
understand university benefits of working with businesses. Um, this is a crucial factor because we come from a long history of universities as Lena presented and only very, very recently we have added the third mission. So working with businesses is actually something quite new for us and quite new for many academics because when they signed off, uh, signed off for um, working in a university, most likely the professors have not been expected to work with businesses. It was, not part, it was simply not part of their job description. Today, however, we expect that, um, that many professors are engaging with societal stakeholders, including businesses, to uh, make more relevant research, but also to then exploit the full value of what they have found. So here we would like to present you the academics point of view, or I have to say the academics point of view, which we find in many universities. And as Lena said, it's a change process and it will take some time. But basically many academics see it like this. There is a university uh, which conducts research and does education, and we have society and we would like to contribute to society. And we do this through, on the one hand, teaching, in which we um, prepare students for uh, future work, we make them employable, but at the same time we also conduct research and we would like to transfer this. From discussions with uh, university academics, we know that they would love to see that all their knowledge and technology would be brought to the market by not-for-profit organizations. So they create the products and services which are then um, introduced to the market and contribute to society development. However, that is not how the real world works. Not-for-profit organizations are only a marginal um, part of um, the, the economy. So most likely there are businesses involved. So the university transfers the knowledge and technology to businesses and these then create the products and services to society. However, this is not really what academics usually feel, um, let's say, attracted by. Because in the middle, there are businesses who are profit-oriented. Um, Not-for-profit not are also only oriented to profit, but then wouldn't use it and it's not their main goal to make the profits. But the reality is that businesses are generally uh, the vehicle to make societal impact. And that is an important thing to understand that we actually, we as universities, we need businesses to transform our research into societal value. Or if you like, they are an important and necessary vehicle. Without them in the middle, even more of our research would never make it to the market and we wouldn't benefit from the health technologies which have developed in universities or um, renewable energies or all these kind of things which we develop, which we invest a lot of time uh, in and with and a lot of resources in, but would not make an impact to society. And impactful universities communicate this also well. So it's important to understand this and communicate that to the academics and of course, um, here it is important that the university selects whom to work with. We, uh, as individual academics, but also as departments, as research centers, as universities, might not work with all the businesses. Um, we might exclude certain industry sectors, such as the military sector. We might exclude certain companies um, which uh, don't have societal value in mind. That is all up to us to, to evaluate. However, the general idea here or the general um, comment is we need to understand that there are businesses out there and we need them as vehicle for transforming university research into societal value. Success factor number, number two is uh, focus on drivers, not barriers. So the, the main um, um, finding which we have here is that many universities try to reduce barriers to UBC as much as they can. However, that is not always the most clever thing to do. Why not? Um, we have a statement here, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. So we cannot actually plan everything in advance. 
Um, there might be changes in the law. There might be changes in the companies, how they interact with you. Um, so all this is to a large degree also uncertain. So if we are trying to just work on reducing the barriers, uh, we might not actually achieve all this. So rather than planning to reduce the barriers, we should be more proactive and trying to create drivers which make us um, overcoming these barriers. And as we, uh, as we cannot plan everything, the approach is rather to aim, shoot and adjust. So have a general plan, then implement the plan, and when it doesn't work perfectly, then adjust with the findings which you have why it doesn't work. And like this is an iterative system how you improve your practice. To make this even more um, tangible, let's say, I use the, um, an analogy from sports. So as the next barriers might come sooner than you think, and you don't know actually which barrier that is, you cannot plan very well. However, as I said, many universities try to do that. So they try to level the field, let's say, and we have here the classical runner, which just runs on an even surface. So there are no barriers at all. That is what we are trying to do at the moment. If we would go to the other extreme, we would have a lot of barriers, then we would have rather a pole vaulter. So we are not helping the academics at all to engage with UBC and we expect them to climb over really, really high walls to engage in this activity, which often they haven't uh, signed up for when they became professors. The optimal way, uh, how we see it, is that you're rather a hurdler. So uh, you know that from sports, when they run 100, 100 meters or 200 meters and they have certain, certain barriers in between, but they jump over it as quickly as possible. So rather than um, reducing the barriers to a minimum, which would be the classical runner, runner um, it is not necessary to invest all the resources in eliminating the barriers. Um, these barriers can still exist to a certain degree, like for the hurdler, but we need to make sure that we have drivers in place, that our academics are willing to jump over these barriers, that they um, face bureaucracy, because there is something bigger which they get out of University Business Corporation. In the end, if we take the classical runner and you're starting to begin a race of 100 meters, why would you actually start the race if there is no driver? So you might actually stay at the starting point and do something completely different. Only if we have the respective drivers involved, these might be incentives, um, these might be, um, can be monetary incentives, but don't have to be, can be recognition for academics, could be just seeing um, your knowledge and technology in application. Um, these kind of things make us engaging in these activities. And once we know the drivers and once we facilitate the drivers, academics are actually um, willing to jump over some barriers. So here our recommendation is don't put too much focus on reducing the barriers, but put a high emphasis on creating drivers which make academics actually engaging in UBC. And the success factor number three is on um, the range of opportunities that UBC actually offers. On the next slide here we see lots of different channels in which we can interact with businesses. Lena also highlighted some uh, in the beginning of this presentation. Uh, for example, uh, we can engage with uh, companies in consulting. We can do licensing. We can do contract research. We can do um, strategic partnerships. We can do workshops together. We can have internships for our students. Um, we can help them in terms of recruitment by uh, connecting the students with them. We can write a thesis together. So there are lots of different ways how we can engage with, uh, with businesses. And it's important to understand that there is not just one or two ways, but there is a lot of different channels we can use. And knowing that there are lots of different channels, we aim to understand how we can actually develop these relationships. So we are talking about relationship marketing and our aim is to develop long-term trusting relationships with the companies and with the institutions around us. 
because when they come back, we also generate continuous resources for us and our, our university. And the idea here is that we don't start right away and aim for a strategic partnership, but relationships develop over time. And this is a very simplified model, which suggests that you start with a small scale project where there is not lots of coordination or commitment, um, but it starts the engagement process. And then you move to several projects. And then you move to the next stage, which is more some, co some more complex projects. On the next stage, you might have some common activities. You, you do something, uh, something on a fair together, um, as an example. And then you move into a partnership. And lastly, you might move even into a strategic partnership where you align maybe the university's interest with the company's interest uh, on a strategic level. So over time, you develop the relationship and you build trust and uh, more commitment. And on the right side, you can see who is then managing the partnership. So if it's not um, very strategic, so on the very lower levels, the first projects may be a thesis with a student or a student project. This is managed on a professor level in the labs. Once it gets more complex, more coordinated, it requires more coordination and commitment, it moves to the dean and the faculty level who is managing it. And lastly, um, we, um, if we talk about more strategic partnerships, then it will be managed by the university board on the university level. So with the development of the relationship, also the organizations or the, the responsible people uh, change who are managing these partnerships. At our university, for example, we know where all the 1,800 partners we have are on these different stages of the relationship. And then we apply norm strategies, how to move them from just engaging with us in one project to several projects, to more complex, to common activities, partners, and even partnerships. Of course, not everyone should become a strategic partner, but we try to develop more trusting and more complex relationships on more different levels with the companies. Okay, with this, I hand over to Lena, who will um, discuss now the uh, remaining three success factors. Okay, so we continue on success factor number four. Uh, UBC goes beyond selling research. Um, as we've been mentioning throughout the, the, the webinar, um, the idea is to change the focus from licensing pattern to a broader engagement uh, communication channel. So if we keep our focus on patents, um, then there is as uh, universities know from experience, um, there are just few patents that can be licensed. And this is because most of the, of the technologies that um, these patents that, uh, contain um, are probably not of the right interest of the industry. And they take a long time to be applied. So we believe that um, as long as the patent is not exploited or licensed, uh, it is a failure. So universities that keep working only on patents are just counting failures. And um, as we said, we believe that the future of universities um, is on their mission, and their mission understood as a social, as a, as a broader social impact. So universities won't be recognized for having hundred patents or thousand patents that are just um, recorded and kept on, on, on a desk, but they will be um, recognized for students and for the international communities for their impact, for the impact they are making on their society. Um, so UBC offer a range of possibilities, as we have seen in the previous uh, examples that we've mentioned with Horsen and before, uh, that um, we can engage with, uh, with different stakeholders to solve problems that uh, are relevant for society and for the right times, instead of um, developing patents that are not going to be exploited. So uh, the, 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 focus, the traditional focus uh, on technology transfer needs to, needs to change. And it has to change from business in, to a business engagement that develops relationships from the very beginning of the development of projects. This means that universities, uh, through their academics, 
uh, will engage with the relevant stakeholders, businesses, industry, but not only that, it could also be uh, government and other type of organizations to understand what their needs are. What exactly are the, the, the problems? What are they lacking? And how they can, together with university, create different solutions. Uh, so in this um, perspective, um, technology transfer is no longer the right way uh, and UBC offers us the way to, to, to do it together and to have a broader impact in, in, the, in the context. Success factor number five, evidence-based manage, management. So, as um, Thorsten mentioned at the beginning, we are a research center and we focus our research on um, UBC, entrepreneurship, innovation. Uh, and we not only create knowledge on these topics, but we also apply that into our university and our region. So, we are um, very lucky to have this um, innovation triangle as the way as, as, um, that we operate. And um, in this side, I'm sorry, in, in this side, we have our analytical unit, which will be the one who is analyzing what type of relationships do we have, um, what, how, are, how big are our stakeholders, what are their needs, how they like to engage, what are, they, what are their main um, characteristics and needs. And we transfer the knowledge either to the operational uh, unit, which is the transfer agency, or the strategic unit, which is the presidential board. Either these two are going to have um, information of first hand on how they should apply better they, their activities. So, for example, the, the transfer agency will know better how to engage with industries in, in our region because now they know um, what, um, what type of needs they have, um, how do they manage their relationships, what type of culture they have, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, they are able to operate better based on the knowledge that we transfer to them. On the other side, the presidential board is able to make um, decisions based on this, this, uh, this data. And in this way, we kind of um, create a feedback loop here uh, in which we can continuously know how, how these new measurements or these new activities uh, have an effect on our, on our region and our companies and in that way develop further our university. So, um, our suggestion is uh, uh, not, of course, that every university implement um, a, a, a research center like ours, but at least to do some activities to know what type of uh, relationships will work in your context, uh, what type of relationships your academics are able to handle, um, and how to, to improve this uh, specifically for your um, organizations. Success factor number six. Um, there is a change of focus, and as I mentioned at the beginning, with this major transformation towards third mission, um, universities are leading this change, and we're going from basic entrepreneurship, education, and technology transfer offices to a broader view of entrepreneurial and engaged university. This means that there is a change process that is long term, is very complex uh, and needs a lot of persistence and a lot of change from everyone at an individual organization and a regional level. This change process is very complex because it involves multiple factors and um, involves the whole the whole university. So, but we need to develop them all to have a, a holistic and a real change and to really have an impact in the a whole higher education system in the years to come. 
we know that an engaged entrepreneur in university um, has different characteristics than a university that only focus on education and research. And here we present um, an example on how different dimensions and characteristics need to change for this type of universities. These uh, dimensions are, um, we're taking this from uh, ACEU, that is the Accreditation Council for Entrepreneurial and Engaged Universities. And they use this uh, framework to analyze how universities um, are on each of these uh, dimensions and how will they need, what will they will need to do to improve um, in the engagement level and entrepreneurial level in their in their region. So, for example, um, there are some factors that are um, more in an individual level. For example, leadership, staff, staff profile, share goals, culture. Uh, those these dimensions are, are more focused on how can we change the mindset of our academics or our management team, uh, even our students, to work towards an engaged entrepreneurial university. Um, but this is not enough. We also need some changes at the organizational level, meaning that they have. Uh, we need new mechanisms, uh, new incentives, new um, uh, strategies that uh, also need to, to, to support the change uh, of our people. Um, for example, here we have um, institutional commitment, uh, financial planning, incentive and rewards, um, education research and third mission activities as um, examples of the dimensions that a university needs, need to work on if they want to, to become more engaged with their, with their context. Um, and again, this is not enough. There, there also needs to be a change in the context, in the region. Uh, so there is a whole ecosystem working uh, towards um, a more applied knowledge and more social impact. Um, in this um, example, uh, we have, for example, um, continuous improvement, influence within the ecosystem, impact, service alignment, internal support structures as the, the dimensions that are related to the region are connected to, to ext external stakeholders that also support the process of change and are the, um, the re recipients of um, what the university is going to offer later on. So there has to be a change not only within the university, but also in the innovation ecosystem around it. So the leader can have some followers and uh, in this way, uh, the activities that um, uh, an academic or students uh, will do will have um, um, some stakeholders that will receive and will respond to this. So um, this is not um, um, an, easy, an easy task and uh, today what we tried to do was to summarize some of the main general factors that um, are needed to, to, to discuss in your universities when talking about UBC. Of course, um, the, the, comp the, the topic is very complex and um, there is a lot to say. Um, especially also because the, each university needs to adjust to their own needs and their own um, spirit for the change to, to, to happen. Um, so for, for our aim for today was to give you a broad overview on why the topic is important um, and it's important at all in the whole university is not only a problem or the technology transfer offices, uh, but it's a change in the culture of the university in how um, future students will evaluate the universities uh, and how uh, the, the, the students will choose what to study, how to engage with their academics, um, the skills they need to develop to become more employable, um, and so on and so forth. So it's a topic that um, it, um, it, um, is important for the whole institution and in some cases, it's just at the beginning. So it needs to start the discussion. It needs to start developing. 
Um, so with that, we are going to, towards the end of our presentation. As a summary, um, we talked today about um, the missions of the university, how we can understand that the, the change to the to the third mission is is a is a major a major change in universities in higher education, um, and how this third mission includes UBC University Business Cooperation, and not only technology transfer. So this means that we focus more on relationships inside and outside the university to create knowledge, to transfer knowledge, and also to create socioeconomical impact. So we see, we understand UBC as the, the, the main uh, vehicle to develop universities in the future. And to do that, we mentioned today some success factors. Uh, the first one is understanding the, the benefits of working with businesses. Um, I come from Latin America, I come from Colombia. I studied my bachelor's degree in a public university. Um, and I know that um, we consider businesses as evil. Um, and this is kind of like the general mindset in, in a public university in Latin America. Um, but what, what we need to understand is that they are a, a very important actor in the society, not only to, 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 to transfer technologies, but to be sure that the university will um, have some, some resources in return that the university can keep working, can keep um, acquiring resources to develop more research and more education opportunities. So it's understanding the benefits instead and working together instead of um, dividing them apart. Um, we also talk about um, the importance to focus on drivers uh, instead of putting a lot of effort in um, trying to get rid of, of the barriers. So, and when we said that, we talk about um, on how to develop the right incentives for, for academics instead of trying to get rid of um, bureaucracy or um, unmotivated um, personnel or other type of uh, barriers that you can have at your own university. The important here is to, want to identify um, what is happening in your own university, what are the main barriers and drivers, um, and focus on those, those drivers that could work better depending on the type of academics uh, that you have. Uh, we also talk about the UBC as a range of collaborations and uh, as a very wide opportunity to, to, to engage uh, with different stakeholders uh, through very small projects, for example, thesis or um, sprints or um, visits to companies, going growing on, on the type of, of project until having a strategic partnerships um, and how to um, get the most out of this, not only to um, develop research, but also to uh, develop more opportunities for students to become more employable, uh, to even create more employment um, and other benefits for, for for, for the students and for the university. Um, we also mentioned to change the focus from patents to relationships. Again, patents is only one way to transfer knowledge and it's a very specific way. Um, we know that um, in the past, patents were the main, the main uh, vehicle to, to transfer knowledge and it has an economic reason. Um, and uh, they are still valid and uh, universities need to keep working on that. But universities also need to open their, their, their efforts towards other ways of, of uh, working together with, with, with companies. Um, in this sense, sometimes and most of the times, the outcome of the relationship is not a pattern, but 
is a, is a solution and is a, an application of the knowledge that is going to be rewarded. Um, we also talk about evidence-based management. Uh, so we invite you all to know a little bit more how your um, academics engage with industry, what type of um, projects they do with their students, um, what is uh, the main type of company that uh, is coming to work with the university, and these kind of things um, is not doing um, is not having a research center like, like ours, as I mentioned, but is knowing what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, and with all these putting together um, these factors, um, we can have a holistic approach towards an entrepreneurial and engaged university. This means that um, lots of changes need to happen at different levels, an individual, organizational and regional level. Um, and it's a long process. Um, is a uh, trial and error, some things will work, some things won't, won't do it, but the important uh, uh, thing is to focus, to know that the focus is on relationships and impact rather than patents and resources. So um, I hope that with this um, you can have a, um, a general view of what UBC is. Um, on how to start the conversations within your university and if you have any questions we're here to, to, to answer them and to support the process as well. Um, we know this topic from research, from practice um, and from a lot of context, not only European context but um, also um, uh, we have worked a lot in Latin America so um, get in contact with us if there is any question or any or if you wish to explore the topic a little bit further um, looking forward to your questions and thank you very much great thank you Thurston and Lina for this presentation and as we collect and type uh, the questions on the, screen in the chat room, I would like to take this opportunity to mention that we have several more webinars programmed within our project. Um, just for you to have an idea, there is Scientific Strategic Cooperation webinar, Quality Assurance for internationalization of higher education, institutional policy strategies, organizational strategies for internationalization, project management and submission. So at least four more topics are in the works. They are being cooking by our partner institutions as they share their best practices. Just very much as the Fachhochschule Munster today has shared their expertise, at least four more of our partner institutions will be sharing with us this, their best practices. We strongly urge you to visit our website for the calendar, dates, and organization of the following topics I just mentioned. Um, bear with us as we offer you the first uh, comment on the screen for our partners to read aloud. Remember that this is being recorded, so voice and video will be available as a full video on our YouTube channel. You can visit our channel and see all previous uh, webinars are already uploaded and in a few weeks you'll be able to see this one as well visit this one as well so we need to verbalize what is being on the screen so it's also been recorded voice and video for, for future reference for all of us um, here we are here are the first comments so Luis Kawachi has already mentioned about how institutions are or must be responsive for their societies or communities. Institutional culture is fundamental to advance in the process of engagement and contribution through knowledge transfer. 
applied science institutions have it on their DNA? And the question is, how to raise awareness of the urgency, pertinence, moral responsibility in all traditional institutions that behave like feudal constructs, hiding behind walls and ramparts, and completely detached from their environment? That's in itself a quite an interesting question. I will mute my microphone for our Okay, so um, addressing the, the first question, applied universities have it in their DNA how to raise awareness of the urgency uh, and uh, pertinence and moral responsibility in all traditional institutions. Um, it's completely right. Applied universities have a big advantage in this respect. Um, working at a German university ourselves, um, we, for example, we have a rule that each professor um, in the university, in any University of Applied Science in Germany, has to have at least five years of practical experience. Without this practical experience, you cannot become a full professor in the University of Applied Sciences. So this changes already the DNA and uh, the profile of the academics quite a lot. Um, it changes, for example, the insights which we have in, uh, into businesses the culture that we have to work with businesses. We know that businesses are more time sensitive. They want to have the results tomorrow instead of in three years when our research project would end. Um, so we, we know how to build relationships and we actually have also lots of relationships with businesses already because we come from practice and we can use these kind of relationships to get started. And getting started is actually one of the things uh, which, uh, which helps to develop UBC in universities. So as we have shown with um, the stairway model, uh, in which we said to start with a small project, do the second project, um, go into common activities, and so on and so forth. Um, this is also how each individual professor should start. Um, rather than aiming for right away for big research projects, start with engaging with companies in a way that, for example, um, in a way that you feel comfortable with. And it doesn't start with right away asking for funding. It might be that you ask for supporting a student. And this is what you get in return. So, uh, as Lena mentioned, got help, working with businesses helps us to transfer our knowledge to, societal, uh, to make societal impact, but also it ensures that we get something back as universities. So, what we are trying to do is exactly uh, getting um, the academics, um, how to say, um, used to work with businesses in exchange, two-way exchange processes. Not just we transfer it, but we get something back. And that needs, uh, needs time. But in terms of raising awareness, it has a lot to do with changing the culture. So, uh, and how do we change actually a culture? In that respect, we need to um, change our communication in the university. We need to acknowledge that we have to develop this, what is called the third mission of universities. We have education, we have research, and then we have this third mission where we often don't know how to call it. We like to call it entrepreneurship and engagement. So, and that we have this third mission and that it's on the agenda of the university and that it's promoted by the board, for example. And continuous communication of good practices, of success cases, um, of all these kind of things. The next is we need to change uh, um, the culture in terms of uh, events or through events. So, more and more hosting events to support academics in this process making sure that they don't feel alone, that there are other academics which started engaging in these activities. And uh, the last thing um, which we also focus on is helping to design universities from the physical environment that it, um, that it supports collaboration with UBC. Um, having co-creation labs where businesses can come in and the academics and the businesses work together on finding solutions is an example. 
So in terms of communication, in terms of events, as well as in terms of facilities, we can do a lot to actually raise awareness and qualify our academics um, to engage uh, in university business cooperation. Even if they haven't, um, ha haven't had any experience in, in, in businesses beforehand. Um, to complement a little bit um, what Thorsten um, has mentioned, um, as I presenting in one of the of the factors, uh, the change is not only in the university but also in the in the in the region or the context around it. And it is very important to take into account the let's say the context pressure, the social pressure that is also happening, and I think it's happening everywhere. Um, and this is the pressure uh, that universities have to be selected by students. And students are changing now. Students now are choosing universities in, way, in, in where they can develop their own ideas, uh, where they can um, uh, work stronger with communities, closer with, uh, with businesses, be more pra practical, less uh, theoretical. Um, so this pressure is, is, is helping to, to raise the awareness in, in, in all academics, let's say like that. Um, uh, and also, uh, we need to take into account that um, this social pressure is, is, uh, is evident in, for example, new rankings methods. Um, uh, before we have the rankings um, of traditional universities, um, uh, number one in research, number one in, in quality of education. Now we have rankings that are measuring their mission. And these type of rankings are uh, being more and more um, common um, uh, for students when they're choosing their, their universities and also uh, in some occasions for governments uh, at the moment of um, um, provide uh, funding to universities. So uh, we, we need to take into account that the, the change is also happening externally and um, um, universities um, at the management level can um, communicate these changes to their to their academics um, and make them aware uh, of the of the change they need to they need to do as well. So now we go to the bottom of the screen with the question that Luis Kawachi has also proposed about governments. Do governments have a role to play in setting policies in place to raise the incentives for institutions to engage the industrial social environment? Um, maybe before we come to that, let me add something to the, the, the second last one in terms of the instinct of self-interest. Actually, that was the main part of my PhD, uh, which I wrote on university industry relationships in the UK. So what I'm saying now applies to the UK, but we see similar um, phenomena in other countries. Um, so in the PhD, I uh, questions what do actually academics in the UK consider as value um, that Oh, which kind of value they would like to create out of university industry relationships. And um, they could um, respond on value created for themselves, value created for their research team, value created for the university, value created for students, uh, for the business involved, as well as society. So basically the main stakeholders in, the, in universities and the relationships. Um, of course, the highest um, demanded value creation was for themselves. I mean, we are human beings, we look after ourselves first, and that is our interest. But surprisingly, um, it was also um, um, very uh, highly rated that they want to create value for their research team, also makes sense, the people around them, and the university. And interestingly, it, they also wanted to create or want to create value for society. However, the two um, stakeholders for which there was no significant results was the value created for businesses and for students. It is quite surprising because students are considered our main target group or main stakeholder in universities. 
And at the same time, when we talk about uh, university business corporation, businesses are the main stakeholders in these transfer processes, right? So we should make them actually happy. We should, we should be interested in creating value for them. So um, that was quite interesting to see. Um, so what I take from this is on one hand, yes, you're, you're, you're right in terms of the self-interest. At the same time, we, the academics are interested in creating value for the people around them and the university, as well as society, but not necessarily businesses. So, and there we come back to one of the success factors where we said, but businesses are necessarily vehicle for creating social impacts. So, and this is what we have to understand and communicate well. The research also found out that if um, academics actually engage in business relationships, they don't like, and there is value created for the businesses, they don't like to talk about it. And on the other hand, if they engaged in business relationships, which created social value, so societal impacts, then they love to talk about it. So we, we like to see uh, ourselves as academics, as someone contributing to society, but not as much uh, to uh, helping businesses to, to grow and um, to help businesses. So uh, we need to communicate that well and change our, um, our perspective on this, in, 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 in my opinion. So to talk about the third question, uh, do government have a role to play in setting policies in place? Um, that was what I just briefly mentioned in the uh, while responding to the first question. Uh, definitely, governments have a role. Um, it's a holistic change that is happening in our societies. Um, it comes again through the triple helix um, uh, approach. So, and that means that we need to work together, not only with businesses, but also with, with government. Um, um, one way that the governments can help to support this change is to, to in the way that they distribute their funding, or how this, they distribute uh, their resources for research and uh, for um, education in general. So um, we see now that um, um, when uh, uh, universities uh, um, apply for funding, um, is, uh, is, is a requirement to ensure that the results will be transferred, will be communicated, um, and uh, this is a way that governments are, are, are using um, new policies to, to, to distribute funding. Um, and I think this will keep changing um, more and more towards um, how to um, uh, universities create more companies or startups or spin-offs or how they uh, create employment, uh, how many communities have they reach and, and things like that. So definitely there is that, that's one way uh, in which governments um, are playing a role. In, in, in the change. Um, also, uh, in the other way around, um, if we incorporate government and industry in, for example, um, not the panel, the board, the university board, uh, we ensure that our, our interests as universities are aligned uh, with, uh, with, with their needs, uh, or at least that we hear each other um, and can work towards that. Um, and also, um, the results of the research can be used for, for policy making and for developing of programs depending on the specific um, needs of one region. So um, it's again multiple factors um, interacting all the time and uh, is um, not only one way, not just government supporting universities, but also universities informing government uh, in, in form of um, um, uh, research uh, outcomes uh, that can be used in, in, in policy making. Um, and with this, um, um, we can see that um, the, the changes are now at a, an ecosystem level, not only at the level of, of the university, not only at the level of government, but it's a continuous change in different levels. And we see that that's happening in, 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 in many countries um, um, at the moment. 
So governments uh, have a crucial role, definitely, and the policies which they can set um, can be in terms of funding distribution, yes, it can be topping up funding for the university, so for example if a university acquires 100,000 of uh, third party funding, they could even top it up to incentivize it from a monetary perspective. But also, as we mentioned before, there, there's lots of non-monetary incentives. For example, the, uh, I think it's the Ministry of Education um, uh, in Malaysia. They are having an award which is the Entrepreneur University of the Year Award. It's hosted by the Ministry and that's very important. We have such an award also in the UK, hosted by Times Higher Education, um, awarded every year. And this idea was taken over uh, by the Ministry in Malaysia to actually celebrate the achievements uh, in the third mission in Malaysian universities. And they make a big event with a celebration with lots of universities taking part. And that is another incentive uh, which can be set by, um, uh, by the university, uh, sorry, sorry, by the governments. So there's lots of activities which they can do to actually to, to foster it, yeah. Great, thank you both Lina and Thurston for this um, interaction with the questions that we had. We have one last slide at the moment that is going to be uploaded by Magda now. And it's coming up, technology. It's wonderful that we can be connected in all different corners of the world. Now, it says, Silvia from Universidad, Universidad Madero wonders if this could be aligned, what you have presented could be aligned to the dual education system. We stop there. Um, yes, so um, I mean, dual education in, in I mean, it's, uh, Germany is very famous for it, and that we have a dual education system where you uh, have a practice part as well as an academic part, let's say. You spend three months in a university and then three months in a company. And that is interchanged um, each each three months. Um, the, fame, the system is, is, is quite famous uh, around the world for it, uh, yet um, it takes uh, governments uh, some time to implement it. But as you can see, there is a, there is a very strong uh, connection then between the universities and the companies. It's not only between the student who goes to the companies, but also the universities. And like this, uh, we have again some e exchange processes um, where uh, the knowledge is directly transferred over the head of the students to the companies. Insights from the companies come uh, with the students back to the university. And usually that uh, the collaboration does not end at this level, um, but then uh, extends to other forms of, of collaboration. And this is why we try to highlight in this presentation some of the channels, some of the cooperation uh, possibilities that exist there. So going beyond the student and the education um, possibilities in terms of cooperation, these relationships can then uh, or are often actually moved into research relationships. And uh, that, is, that is also uh, very good for the, uh, for the universities because they can develop long-term relationships, trusting relationships, uh, again, giving um, certain resources back from the business sector to the university. All right, in closing, uh, the last question we have here is from Laura from Universidad Ort, Uruguay. And she wonders if you are familiar with the AIM Day methodology developed by Uppsala University. How does your approach compare with an um, yeah, a little bit familiar with it, uh, uh, we are, um, whereby I'm not sure how um, this methodology extended because it has been transferred also to many other different universities um, because it was also mentioned as a, as a good and best practice uh, in many publications and today, as far as I know, it helps to connect 
um, in a very broad sense, the university and the academics uh, with external stakeholders and lots of events are, uh, and uh, trainings are organized around it. So uh, definitely that is a, it's a great methodology and uh, it, it's something to ha have a look at um, because it makes things practical. And uh, when we discuss today uh, some of the common or more general success factors, this is a very good example of how to get started and how to not reinvent the wheel, but how to look at one of these good practices from around the world to reflect upon why it works actually at Uppsala University and if it could also work at your university. So, um, and we, um, this is just one example. What we do in our research center as well is we, we collect these kind of good practices around the world and put them in a kind of a toolbox um, to share them again with the universities we're working with. Because that speeds up the process quite a bit in developing a strategy and developing structures in the university to outperform other universities in the third mission. So um, basically we are working with a toolbox of tools. Um, these are marketing but also management tools, uh, tools from innovation, but at the same time using good practices um, to bring insights from other parts of the world, from other organizations, uh, which help to um, kickstart basically the third mission at universities. Um, to complement that, um, it also needs to take into account the, the culture of the, not only of the university, but uh, also the, 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 the country you are, you're in. Um, because um, this uh, aim day methodology um, requires, um, sorry, is based on a lot of networking and is uh, like a storytelling to transfer, um, to share knowledge on a topic, specific topic. Um, this could work on my view, my personal experience in uh, countries like, for example, Australia, where they love networking sessions. However, if you would like to transfer that methodology in Germany or at least say in Münster, it might not work that well because here people don't tend to go to networking sessions um, per se. Uh, so it here probably works a little bit more uh, using um, uh, a fair uh, or an open day uh, in which business get together with other actors and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, get, I think the most important thing is that each university understands what works for them, what works uh, uh, in, in, their, in their region and adapt any methodology on that. Um, and also to understand that this methodology has a specific purpose of bringing people together and develop a story around that to start creating trust, um, to start developing potential relationships. Uh, but it's not the only, it's not the only um, tool that can be used um, and shouldn't be the only one. Uh, it has to, to, to work in, in many other different directions. So it is important to understand where your university is, what your university needs, and what uh, methodology or tool can be adjusted or, or applied in which context. Excellent. Thank you both. We have one last slide as we approach. <laughs> yeah, it's 8.30. Because yeah. you must be starving. It must be or dinner time. Yeah, in Germany. And lunch time for many of us in the new world. <laughs> um, Magda is uploading the last slide that we have for comments and questions. And the first one, it's a comment from um, our fellow. Okay, is it moving? Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you, Magda. Thank you. All right, here it is. So, Silvia from Uni Universidad Madero comments that the company should be open to have this relationship with the universities in order to work together and find out which are the requirements for the business around the geographical region and the society in their surroundings and help the universities make their research and the preparation for the students where, when they finish their studies. Yes, I, I, I can only agree to this comment. Um, and here we can see the interrelationships between the third mission and the first mission of, uh, of education and how it, uh, it refers back to um, getting insights into what actually students need to know when they finish their studies. And uh, as the world is getting more and more dynamic, and these kind of um, uh, sk the skills which the student need is changing more rapidly, it is important to have very close contact to the companies which can give us these insights, what is actually needed and what they want from the students um, in terms of employability of the students. So um, especially if we talk about, let's say, uh, IT, artificial intelligence, um, the, the, the change in skills and knowledge is so rapid that we need to change our curricula every year, or every second year, whereby 20 years ago, there has been uh, hardly any change for a couple of years. So in order to address this, we need to understand what the businesses in the geographical region and in society need. So I, I completely agree to that. You want to add to this? Um, I think we, we, we talked today only about the, the efforts that universities can do uh, for getting closer in contact with companies. Um, we haven't talked about uh, what, are, what businesses think or what is our experience from the business side, uh, which also um, is probably a, another topic. Um, but definitely uh, we are taking here the, the, the perspective of the university is taking the, the, the lead in driving these changes. Uh, sometimes the university is the one who will have to knock on the door of the companies. Uh, some other times the, the, the companies will come to the university because they know that they need knowledge. Um, so it's probably working on both sides. And one other thing is um, as uh, students are also changing, once our new students with this new mindset going to companies, they will be more open to this type of knowledge. Um, as an example, uh, years before, it was very difficult to see a PhD, uh, uh, um, a person with a PhD working on a company. Now, uh, more and more companies are taking uh, doctors because they know their value, they know their analytical uh, capacities, they know the, the, the knowledge behind, they know the connections with the university. Um, so it's also a process that, um, that is slow, but it's also changing from the business side. Great. And in closing, now, Ana Nunez from UNASH in Mexico would like to know if you think higher education institutions need additional protection for the proprietary knowledge generated during their partnerships with businesses beyond patents and license, licenses. Uh, I cannot respond uh, on the systems which are uh, existing in Latin America, but even if we talk about Europe or in Germany, um, my point uh, on this is if you have, uh, if you focus on a transactional model where uh, the main focus is on, on patenting and then you try to license it. It is important to have uh, a very good uh, IP system and a strong IP system which protects the universities. Because you're not building relationships with the companies, but you tra just transfer the knowledge unidirectional, let's say. Um, in our university, there has never been any problem in terms of intellectual property with companies because we build long-term relationships with them. 
and they are trusting. And even if there would be an opportunity to, um, let's say, uh, be opportunistic, that wouldn't happen because that would risk the relationship. And the relationship between the university and the companies is uh, of highest interest to both parties. So as Lena um, said during the presentation, technology and IP uh, is important, but for us, it is part of the relationship which is the most important. So we take a relationship approach towards it. And every issue which comes up in terms of technology and intellectual property is often actually not a problem as long as the relationship is trusting and has been, uh, then the partners are committed to it. So um, it really depends, uh, and I cannot talk about the Latin American system. Um, that would be something to have basically a closer look at. All right, with that, we thank all of you. Danke, Thurston. Gracias, Lina. Thank you, everyone, for attending and for your interest on this tremendous hot topic, trending topic now, universities in the new, in the new uh, generation. Uh, we invite you to stay tuned for the following um, webinars that we'll be having. We strongly urge you to visit our website for the calendar and we look forward to having all of you again in the next of our series of webinars. Mael, Buenas noches just a quick, just a quick remark. Uh, thank, of thank you to all of you because I think you, you gave, you throw us your best energy. My baby has slept like an angel so far. So I think I, we need to have webinars more often. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I completely agree. And I completely agree, uh, Ismail. It's a hot topic, and I'd like to come back to uh, Anna's comment. And I completely agree with that as well. We need to tropicalize the model, and we are very much up for that. So uh, please come back with us to us with feedback, or if we can collaborate, we are more than happy to to engage in this tropicalization. Excellent. Good evening, good night to you, and for the rest of us, buen provecho. Bye-bye now.